Good morning, everybody. Welcome to IIMSC, Empowering People, Enhancing Education. Uh, I'll be taking pharmacology classes for all of you. Before we get to the uh, uh, our lecture, uh, let us have an uh, introduction. Pharmacotherapy of myasthenia gravis. So what is it? Before uh, we get to the introduction of myasthenia gravis, uh, let us uh, uh, briefly look into the contents of our uh, topic. Introduction to myasthenia gravis, acetyl, uh, a brief introduction as acetylcholine storage, uh, synthesis, release and its degradation. And also the diagnostic test used to diagnose uh, myasthenia gravis and uh, the most important part of uh, our uh, topic is the management of the pharmacotherapy of myasthenia gravis and the adverse effects of the drug drugs used in the pharmacotherapy and also the contraindications or uh, the drugs which actually aggravate myasthenia gravis. These are the contents we will uh, look under the why myasthenia gravis is important. Most of our celebrities do suffer from myasthenia gravis. And our very Indian uh, uh, famous legend star uh, Amitabh Bachchan also is having this uh, myasthenia gravis. All right. Now let us see what it is. Introduction. Myasthenia gravis is an acquired autoimmune disorder which has skeletal muscle weakness and increased fatigability. I hope you all know what an autoimmune disorder is. Autoimmune disorder means a very immune system attacks the host or our, the body so it which is also associated uh, which is due to the deficiency of optic neuromuscular acetylcholine receptor complex basically autonomic nervous system is uh, divided into the uh, sympathetic parasympathetic uh, uh, and the uh, enteric nervous system but the peripheral nervous system is actually divided into the uh, um, the peripheral yeah peripheral nervous system is basically sub uh, is subdivided into somatic nervous system and autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system uh, is the one which actually sub has two types of neurons: the sensory neurons and the motor neurons. Sensory neurons carry the information from cutaneous and sensory uh, receptors in the peripheral organs to the CNS, whereas motor neurons conduct impulses from the CNS to skeletal muscles only. Skeletal muscles are under voluntary control. It means they are consciously controlled. Okay, and as you all know, the voluntary functions uh, generally include the locomotion, respiration, posture, and the deep tendon reflexes. But why are we considering it the somatic nervous system under the autonomic nervous system? It's because they have the motor and plate carries the cholinergic receptors. Thereby, the neurotransmitter involved is the acetylcholine and the receptor type is the nicotinic muscle type. Basically, the nicotin, uh, there are two types of receptors the par, under the parasympathetic nervous system. That is nicotinic and muscarinic. And the nicotinic has nicotinic neuronal type and nicotinic muscle type. We are only considering the neuron, nicotinic muscle type because the somatic nervous system has this nicotinic muscle type receptors on its motor end plate. I hope I'm clear about this. Okay. Now, why is there a deficiency of the receptor complex? Because it is associated with production of IgG antibody that binds to acetylcholine receptors at post-junctional motor end plate, your normal NMJ transmission, all right? Your nicotinic, mus uh, nicotinic muscle type receptors are, pre are present at the neuromuscular junction. This is your neuron and this is the muscle. This carries an action potential to the muscle and these are the receptors, the nicotinic muscle type receptor present in the on the muscle and these carries an action potential and transmit to, to the mu skeletal muscle whereby there is a contraction of the muscle. This is how a normal uh, uh, physiology of neuromuscular transmission. But what, what happens in the myasthenia gravis? There is a blocking of your receptors due to the 
antibodies formed against it because uh, as I told you it is an autoimmune disorders so our very uh, our, our immune system attacks our body thereby blocking the receptors and blocking these receptors by the antibodies and thereby you can see there is no such neuromuscular transmission by uh, that means the neuron cannot pass a action potential further all right now it is uh, associated with uh, anti acetylcholine receptor antibody titers is mostly raised in 90 percent of patients with myasthenia gravis and thereby there is a decrease in number of nicotinic muscle type receptors thereby decreased decreased amplitude in end plate potential which fails to trigger an, an action potential so thereby you don't see any change in your membrane potential so the uh, so what i would like to tell you is there is a block hello. very simple thing is uh, the myasthenia gravis blocks hello yeah ma'am can you uh, full screen the slide ma'am hello yeah ma'am thank you ma'am thank you continue okay all right so basically uh, a brief introduction uh, about uh, myasthenia gravis is basically there is a blocking of the nicotinic uh, uh, muscle type receptors present on the motor end plate and thereby there is no uh, the action potential doesn't pass on from your neuron to your muscle thereby there is no contraction of your muscle and thereby there is a weakness as well as there is a fatigability uh, of the muscle okay before uh, now let us see uh, why are we talking about this uh, a brief introduction on acetylcholine the reason behind the discussion on this is once we understand the synthesis storage of acetylcholine our management or the pharmacotherapy of myasthenia gets a lot more easier okay now this is your neuron and this is your motor end plate or the muscle to which the action uh, the action potential passes on from neuron to muscle all right so these are so these are the receptors present so generally so what happens is uh, let us see how the acetylcholine synthesis the neurotransmitter is actually synthesized okay the acetylcholine is synthesized in your neuron initially there is acetylation of the colon along acetylation of the colon along with the acetyl coa okay so they have together form acetylcholine with the help of enzyme choline acetyl transferase the enzyme responsible for the synthesis of acetylcholine is this enzyme this is one of your important bit in your pg when you appear for your post graduation entrance exam okay all right thereby acetylcholine is released and it triggers an action potential and creates a change in the membrane potential of the muscle the acetylcholine recept acetylcholine binds to the receptors present here and thereby there is a change in the membrane potential okay all right so how is it stored stored acetylcholine is uh, uh, released and it is carried into vesicles present here and along with acetylcholine there is also a p peptides stored as co-transmitters all right okay so whenever there is a uh, influx of calcium this acetylcholine this is whenever there is an influx of calcium ions there is an uh, uh, acetylcholine is released by the process called exocytosis what is this exocytosis exocytosis is there is a protein which binds with uh, vesicles that is synaptobrevin and there is a protein which binds to the nerve membrane they both unite and create a pore which is nothing but the exocytosis thereby this acetylcholine is released out and once it binds to the receptors it transmits its action that is your action potential and once its action is done this acetylcholine is secreted by the enzyme acetylcholine esterase so 
this is very important for your management okay why we need this acetylcholine and why we need the enzyme called acetylcholinesterase okay so let us get into the next one okay this uh, uh, this is how it binds with the enzyme this is your acetylcholine and this is your acetylcholinesterase enzyme okay now what happens is um, uh, am I audible, students? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Okay. The quaternary nitrogen or the acetylcholine binds to the anionic of the acetylcholine esterase enzyme, and the car the carbon the carbon of the acetoxy uh, group of acetylcholine binds to the hydroxy group of the ester site of acetylcholinesterase. Okay, let me simplify it. There are, um, let's make us, okay. Uh, there are two sites, okay. These two sites are occupied by two, uh, two parts of the uh, uh, acetylcholine neurotransmitter, okay. This is, uh, your acetylcholine and this is your acetylcholine esterase enzyme. When they both bind together, there is a degradation. Uh, there, that is how action potential is done. After the action potential is done, how it degrades. So this is how they bond the nitrogen group of the acetylcholine and the carbon group of the carbon of the acetoxy group of acetylcholine with acetic site of acetylcholine esterase enzyme. This is how they create a complex. And now, now this is how there is a cleavage. Now there is a cleavage of uh, your, this is how your colon is recycled. Colon is again formed and which is recycled for again synthesis of another neuro neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Okay. There is, there is hydrolysis of this product and this is how it is formed. Okay. So there is regeneration of choline and also there is regenerate the active enzyme still choline histories. Okay. What are the clinical features of this myasthenia gravis? There is weakness of muscle and fatigue in this disorder which worsens after exercise and goes off after rest. Well, you might have a confusion how it should be differentiated from the physiological exercise and the myasthenia gravis. Usually, physiological exercise is associated with muscle pain, whereas myasthenia is not associated with muscle pain. There is weakness with fatigue. All right, this is how you can differentiate. Okay, initially, uh, that is uh, the early features are fast moving muscles are involved. What are fast moving muscles? Which contract fast and also fatigue very fast. Okay. To start with, there is ptosis. What, what, uh, ptosis is the drooping of your eyelid. And uh, the, it is also associated with diplopia, which is not uh, having double vision. And also slurred speech. There is also difficulty in swallowing and weakness of extremities. All right. Now, which also progresses to all the muscles, uh, including your respiratory muscles. Most and usually myasthenia gravis is also involves the thymus. Okay, thymus is uh, present near your mediastinum. So most of them have this thymoma, the tumor of the thymus. So there is pathological abnormality in nearly 75% cases. Okay, what are the diagnostic tests uh, involved in myasthenia gravis? As we, ju uh, as we just discussed, there is uh, the tumor of the thymus. So, I uh, using CT and MRI, we can uh, figure out the pathological abnormality in 75% cases. Also, we can also measure the anti-acetylcholine receptor titers using the immunoprecipitation assay. All right. And the third investigation is the electromyography. Electromyography is nothing but the uh, uh, to measure 
the nerve stimulation at the motor end plate. So generally, uh, we record a response uh, to the nerve stimulation at a frequency of 3 per second. But this test is usually done before giving any kind of medication to the patient. Okay, thereby uh, we see how a single muscle fiber re uh, uh, reacts to the frequency being given to the nerve. Okay. And there is a detection of the anti-striated muscle antibody. As we already discussed, there are the antibodies that bind to the uh, NM receptors on the motor end plate. Also, we also need to see the pulmonary functioning test. As I, as I just told you, the clinical features which uh, progresses to the respiratory muscles, we need to know the strength of the lungs. And one of the very important, uh, 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 you know, uh, test is the uh, adrophonium test or the tensilon test. This is also important as uh, as a as an undergraduate. This is one of the important questions. As all and as well during a post graduation, there are a lot of questions based on this adrophonium test. Okay, let us see why this adrophonium test is done. First of all, let us ad adrophonium is one of the reversible anticholinesterase drug. Okay, why are we using this? Because this is a short acting one. Okay, now what are the indications? If anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody titus measurement is not available or negative, but the patient clinically sh shows the signs of muscular weakness, all right? So whenever the titers are not available or negative, we might go to this adrophonium test. And also to differentiate between the myasthenia crisis and cholinergic crisis. So what is cholinergic crisis? Whenever there is an excessive acetylcholine also, it equally shows a muscle weakness. So to, to, uh, to differentiate that, we give the drug adrophonium. So how is it done? Initially, we give uh, 1 to 2 milligrams of uh, adrophonium intravenously. Okay. So once we give this drug, immediately we see that if the patient condition further worsens, we can easily conclude it as cholinergic crisis. But if there is an improvement, it is easily uh, diagnosed as myasthenia crisis. So further, once this is confirmed, further, if it is myasthenia crisis, further we have to give them 5 to 8 milligrams of uh, of adrophonium intravenously. Thereby, we see there is an improve in muscle strength and there is abolition of ptosis and also increase in the vital capacity. Okay? Okay. So, now let us go to the management. Okay? This is uh, our pharmacotherapy of myasthenia gravis. The first group of drugs which we are using is reversible anticholinesterase agents. Okay? Generally, uh, what we see is there are three uh, uh, under parasympathetic drugs, there are two uh, directly acting and indirectly acting. Under indirect, directly acting uh, uh, drugs usually mimic acetylcholine, whereas indirectly acting drugs usually uh, bind to the receptors and thereby uh, have an acetylcholine-like action. Why are we considering only, there are two types under indirectly acting, reversible and irreversible. Now why are we considering only reversible? It is because these drugs are generally, uh, myasthenia gravis has a very timely changes in its symptoms. To adjust the dose, it is easy to use reversible, whereas indirectly have rather long action and it is very, diff mm. very difficult to control the desired dose, okay? That is the reason we don't use irreversible, okay? Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Okay. Reversible anticholinist agent are of mostly we consider to be an intermediate action. Adrophonium is short-acting. 
So we generally use it only for the diagnostic test, but not for the in uh, the management. All right. So initially we give an empirical therapy, later a prolonged therapy. Depending on the symptoms, depending how is it and consider it whether an early or a progressive stage or an advanced stage. So depending on that, we give them an empirical therapy depending on their symptoms and thereby we maintain the doses. All right. Uh, the, uh, the drugs which we generally consider for myasthenia gravis uh, under reversible, uh, this is given orally 30 to 60 mg thrice a day till satisfactory response is seen. And the other group of drug uh, given is aminonium. All right, that is given about 2.5 to 5 mg 6 hourly orally. All right. Okay. Now, when we are considering about reversible anticholinesterase agents for the management of myasthenia gravis, one important thing to be considered is the titration of do doses during this. All right. So, uh, generally after the prolonged treatment or over treatment with anticholinesterase agents, the patient condition may swing between the myasthenia crisis or the cholinergic crisis. So whenever there is an under treatment, there is a myasthenia crisis. Whenever there is an over treatment by higher doses, we see the cholinergic crisis. So we should have a continuous monitor over their drugs. So because for ultimately, either if there is an under treatment or an over treatment, the patient lands up in muscular weakness. So it is very important to have a check over the dosages day to day. So, so, uh, so depending on the con on the their uh, uh, general condition, the doses have to be adjusted. So every time we do that, uh, we should make sure we are again doing a test called tensilon test. Uh, by doing this, we I, uh, if there is an improvement. Uh, in the uh, patient's condition, it is uh, understood that the, uh, the patient still needs the reversible enzyme uh, agents. If the patient condition is worsening, it is understood that the patient is already under toxicity due to over treatment by higher doses. So thereby, this is a, one of the important things to be noticed under the management is titration of doses. All right. Okay. When we are using these drugs, generally we tend to see uh, the toxicities under uh, these drugs. So what are the toxicities? First, there are two types of side effects we see under the uh, management under anticholinesterases. That is muscarinic side effects and nicotinic side effects. Now, what are the muscarinic side effects? Flushing of face, salivation, that is excessive secretion, sweating. Lacrimation, that is the tears, uh, uh, watering of eyes, nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, and the bronchoconstriction. All right. And what are the nicotinic type of side effects? Muscle fasciculations and twitching, muscular weakness, and the tremors. So, how do we treat the uh, these toxic effects? If muscarinic side effects are the dominant, then we give them an open of MG subcutaneously. All right. Now, one of, uh, of the, however, uh, remember one thing that our new stigma toxicity itself is adjusted by its muscarinic manifestations. So, so we should make sure. We should make sure first of all. As a physician, as a doctor, you should be able to differentiate if the myasthenia uh, graves patient is a crisis or a cholinergic crisis. So, depending on that, you put the patient very well. So, for you to recognize that, there are only two simple clinical features you have to look into. That is, make sure the person is uh, relieved of the skeletal muscle weakness and its fatigue. Okay. All right. And the, uh, other than the main reversible anticholinesterase agents, uh, there are also other kind of measures used to treat myasthenia gravis. 
the first type uh, uh, the first uh, group we see is the immunosuppressants that's corticosteroids prednisolone 10 mg once a day orally as well uh, azathioprine 2.5 mg per kg per day orally and cyclosporin 2.5 mg per kg per day orally so depending on the patient's condition the corticosteroids can be used once a day or alternate day and increase slowly day by day once we see an improvement there we have to taper the doses of corticosteroids okay now uh, uh, the immunosuppressants uh, like azotyprin and cyclosporin whenever we are giving these kind of drugs we should make sure we are having a check on the patient's complete blood count and the liver function test because there is every possibility of these drugs to alter the C, uh, complete blood count and liver function test so all these drugs are generally beneficial in the advanced cases of myasthenia gravis all right what is the other kind of treatment all right Th that is thymectomy what is thymectomy that is a removal of the thymus gland when uh, why when is it advised whenever the myasthenia is associated with thymoma or when the disease is not controlled with combination of prednisolone and anticholinesterase drug or prednisolone and azotheprin. So whenever, whenever the above management is tried and still the patient is not responding, in such patients we can use, we can reset the thymus. Okay. So only remember one thing, we should make sure that there is an abnormality in the thymus. The, whenever we see a thymus on a CT and when the above uh, medical management is already given only then we can uh, try this thymectomy okay next one of the life saving measures is the plasma pharesis okay what is plasma pharesis we are making sure that it is filtered off the antibodies so this one this import uh, the import uh, when is it used is it is only advisable in non responders to thymectomy and treatment with steroids and anticholinesterase agents so whenever the above three kinds of measures are already tried and the patient is still not responding in such patients this plasma pharesis can be done so this plasma pharesis helps to decrease in the titers of anti nm receptor antibodies all right so this is also one of your pg bits what is the life saving measure of myasthenia gravis is usually asked during your viva or during your practical questions what is the life saving measures that is the plasma pharesis also we can treat the patient with intravenous immunoglobulins all right so this is your important management Okay, let us uh, quickly look into it. Uh, initially, we are treating the patient with uh, reversible anticholinesterase agents like neostigmine, pyridostigmine, ambinonium. And in case if we see uh, any myasthenia, uh, uh, if we see any cholinergic crisis, then these are the symptoms you see. And we usually treat the patient uh, with atropin. And uh, we also uh, treat the patient uh, with uh, the immunosuppressants. And when the, these two don't work, we treat the patient with thymectomy, then uh, it is also including thymoma. And the life-saving measures like plasma pharesis and intravenous immunoglobulins, mostly in the advanced cases. Uh, I hope I'm clear with my management. The contraindications. So uh, generally drugs which aggravate myasthenia gravis. For this to be easier, especially in your, uh, this is asked during your uh, PG bits. I made it easy by considering it as A, B, C, D, E. So what does your A include? The antibiotics and antiarrhythmics. The antibiotics like aminoglycosides, which include streptomycin, gentamicin, and amikacin. And macrolide, uh, uh, macrolides like azithromycin. And quinolins like ciprofloxin. And polymyxin and cholestin. 
these are the kind of antibiotics which inhibit acetylcholine release thereby we should make sure that we are not prescribing such drugs to patients having myasthenia gravis because there is also already a deficiency of acetylcholine and further if these drugs inhibit the release of acetylcholine there is worsening of your weakness and the fatigability and also we should not we should make sure that we are not prescribing antiarrhythmics in patients uh, having myasthenia gravis uh, so usually the drugs like tocanamide quinidin and propanolol uh, uh, quinidin these are the drugs under antiarrhythmics and uh, uh, beta blockers like propanolol i'm sorry for the slide uh, which should have been included in the next page beta blockers are like uh, Propanolol uh, are usually contraindicated and botulinum toxin also should be uh, 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 make sure we are not prescribing because more all of these drugs usually inhibit acetylcholine release and uh, 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 drugs like morphine also because uh, we as we see myasthenia gravis has a respiratory depression that is a, a weakening of uh, respiratory muscles morphine already has a tendency to suppress uh, respiratory system so further uh, prescribing uh, uh, morphine also will adverse the condition of the patient and chloroquine and quinine also uh, should not be uh, generally considered for patients uh, having myasthenia gravis and uh, and few uh, uh, your uh, skeletal muscles uh, relaxants like uh, uh, d tuberculin pancuronium and vecuronium are the drugs which also inhibit uh, already it is uh, all these drugs give a muscle relaxant uh, phase so further already a patient having myasthenia gravis is already suffering from a uh, weakness further these drugs will further worsen the condition all right and uh, other uh, uh, general anesthetics like methoxyfluorine and also one of your antipsychotic drugs lithium general in anesthetics as you all know uh, has a um, muscle relaxation so already the patient is having weakness so we generally contra indicate these kind of drugs as well lithium also inhibits the acetylcholine release so make sure uh, it is easily remembered a b c d e all right thank you so much